So uh, usually I consider uh, the homogeneous equation, uh, but then I realized that I made the thing too uh, complicated. So today I simplify a little bit. I just consider this uh, simple homogeneous equation, uh, x0 to the n plus blah blah to the x r to the n to zero. And I regard as an equation over the finite fields uh, with q elements. Here q is a power of uh, 6 prime p. And I've uh, made an uh, assumption n is a uh, factor of q minus 1. Under this assumption, yesterday I compute the number of solutions to this homogeneous equation. Uh, it can be written as q to the r plus q minus 1 times the huge sum. So here the sum is taken for all the r plus 1 tuples. Here each of these alpha i is between 0 and 1. And uh, if you multiply n to uh, this alpha i, you get the integer. And for each of these alpha i, actually you can uh, define a character of the multiplicative group of the uh, of FQ. You just send the generator of this multiplicative uh, group to the comp uh, complex number e to the 2 pi f alpha. And uh, for, each, uh, for these r plus 1 tuples, you have r plus 1 uh, characters. And uh, yesterday I defined the so-called Jacobi sum for these r plus 1 uh, uh, characters. And it turns out that if the number of solutions has this expression. Uh, so today, I will consider a similar but different problem. Uh, here, I can consider this homogeneous equation. It defines a substance in the projective space. So this homogeneous equation. It defines a hypersurface, actually. which I denoted by S inside the projective space. So if you don't know what the projective uh, space is, tell you actually it's just uh, R plus one tuple of elements in K, but you, uh, you need to remove the origin. In other words, these coordinates should not be all zero. And then uh, you make an equivalent class uh, on this set here to r plus 1 tuple are said to be equivalent if and only if the corresponding coordinates are uh, constant multiples of each other if and only if uh, some c in the final view of k such that this is i equals to c one i for all i. Okay, so in other words, if two r plus one tuples are just different by a constant, uh, then we regard them at the same point in the projective space. Or more geometrically, you can think about the geometric, uh, the projective space as the set of uh, straight lines passing through the origin in the r plus one dimensional affine, affine space. Uh, and if you have such a homogeneous polynomial, it is meaningless to talk about the value of this polynomial on any points in the projective space because the coordinate can change this by an arbitrary constant multiple. But it, it is meaningful to talk about the zeros of this homogeneous polynomial in this sense. Because if you if the homogeneous polynomial polynomial vanish at this one uh, one representative of the coordinates, and you multiply 
uh, the same constant multiple for all the coordinates, then the new coordinate is also a solution to this homogeneous polynomial. Okay? So in this way, uh, if you just consider the zero of this homogeneous polynomial, they give you a subset uh, of the projective space. And then now, I want to count the number of k value points on this hypersurface. So I use this nq prime, because it's definitely different from that nq, to be the number of k, k rational points on this hypersurface mass. Or in other words, all the uh, points in the protective space whose coordinates satisfy this homogeneous equation. Actually, you can compute this number from this number very easily. Because here, it's just this nq is the number of the solutions to this homogeneous equation. And uh, then, you can, if you have a solution here, you want to see whether it, it gives you a point uh, in the projective space or on the hypersurface or not. But there's one solution must be excluded because if you just take all the xi to be zero, it definitely gives you a solution for this homogeneous equation. But it is, it is not a point in the projective space. Okay, so first you need to remove one solution. You get one less. And then you consider if you have two solutions to this homogeneous equation, but they are just different by a constant scalar, then in the projective space, they, are, they should be considered as the same class. So if you want out by this equivalent class, you need to divide by q minus 1, because here you should have uh, k minus 1 choices of this constant multiple, because this c must be non-zero. If you multiply 0, all the coordinates are 0. But that doesn't satisfy this condition. So in total, you should have q minus 1 uh, choices of the constant. And then, this quotient is just a number of k rational points on this hypersurface mass. Now we have this expression, then we have an explicit expression for the number nq prime. Uh, it is given by 1 plus q plus, plus q to the uh, r minus 1 plus sigma alpha. Uh, J alpha. Here our alpha is just abbreviation of this set. Okay, so this is how you count. Uh -huh. uh, first, uh, in this solution, in all the, among all the solutions to this homogeneous equation, uh, there's one special, all the uh, x size are zero, but that's not a point in the projective space. Any other question? Okay, so uh, this formula gives you uh, a way to compute the number of k rational points on this hypersurface. But you know that actually this hypersurface is defined by the zeros of a homogeneous equation defined over f cubed. And now, I want to extend the base field a little bit. For example, that is Ks over K uh, is a finite field. It's a finite extension. This Ks is also a finite field, and uh, it's a uh, finite number, it's q to the x. Then I want to compute, I just want to do the same discussion uh, for these fields, where in other words, I want to compute the number of Ks rational points on this hypersurface. I denoted by n prime q to the s. Denote this number, this notation, and then basically you just you can use these results. You just replace q by q to the s, 
because nothing changes when you extend the fields except uh, the base field. But the last sum, you, uh, you need to be a little bit careful. So again, you need to take the sum of, uh, over all R plus 1, 2 calls, which is this kind of condition. But you should be very careful about this Jacobi sum. Here, this Jacobi sum it is the Jacobi sum of the characters by chi 0 s, uh, chi alpha 0. But I, at the s on the top, I will explain why I use this notation. Chi alpha r s. These are characters from <coughs> f2 to the s. These are the characters of this multiplicity. In other words, here, <coughs> even if you're your inputs are the same uh, rational numbers. The output, uh, namely the characters, actually they are different. Here, this chi alpha is a character of fq, which is defined this way. And what is chi alpha s? You know, by definition, it's a character of the multiplicative group of this finite. And uh, by definition, we need to choose a, a generator of this cyclic group that denoted by omega s. And then I map it to 2 pi i alpha. So these are two completely different characters. So there is no, I mean, at least just from the definition, it's not obvious how these two Jacobi sum are related. OK? But actually, The relation is not very difficult to, to state. Um, so I need to, to study the relation between the two Jacobi sums. I need to consider the norm map. Uh, any element here, x, uh, to x times Frobenius x, uh, times Frobenius uh, square x, times Frobenius uh, x. You apply Frobenius s minus 1 times x, and then you take the product. Frobenius here is just send any elements to x to the, to the q's power. Uh, so this is a homorphism, sorry, homorphism from this uh, multiplicative to this multiplicative. And another important property for this norm map is that this is a subjective map. This one. Okay? So now, if I have a character of the multiplicative of FQ, Uh, then it can get automatically here we have the norm map but then I can pose this norm map with an arbitrary character <coughs> then I get a character of the multiplicative group of this library okay um, but as I remarked here, the norm map is surjective, and both of these multipli uh, multiplicative group are cyclic. So it must map any generator of, the, of this group to a generator of this group. Okay? So by this observation, if you just choose the generator of these two cyclic groups in a suitable way, 
which should have the relation is chi alpha s is equal to the composite of these two maps. Let me emphasize here, you, you really need to choose carefully about the generators to make this whole. Okay? Uh, and based on this fact, uh, Bumbot and Hasse prove a relation between the Jacobi sum, between these two Jacobi sums. Their result is this. This Jacobi sum is the S power of the Jacobi sum on the top, but this is true up to a side. So here S is the degree of this finite field extension. And this R here, R plus one is the number of characters uh, you can see there in the general. I, actually they prove uh, first they prove a result for the for the Gauss sum. And then we know that the Jacobi sum is a product uh, of Gauss sum uh, up to a constant. Then they, they have this result. But uh, I do not want to introduce more, uh, more notations, so I just only state their results in terms of the code. Okay, so now from these, their results, you can see the relation uh, between these two Jacobi sums, and also you can see the relation between these two numbers. Okay, so, but here this finite extension can be taken arbitrarily, and we have a lot of num these numbers. And uh, I want to use a single function to record all these numbers at the same time. So I just consider the formal power series. This f 
although its definition is quite complicated, but actually, uh, you do the computation, it is, the outcome is not that bad. So these R terms correspond to these the first R terms. And uh, for the Jacobi, uh, for the part of the Jacobi sum, actually it gives you negative one to the, the R, and uh, you take the sum for all those alphas, uh, then you can have B over the U, uh, the natural logarithm, the logarithm function of a linear function, and here this C alpha is basically uh, the Jacobi sum, but we should have a sign. Okay. So originally, I defined uh, such a complicated form of power series, but it turns out that you can write this as the sum of several simple pieces. Actually, each piece is the derivative of, a log, of the logarithm function of a linear function. Okay? Uh, then, actually, I want to recover the product of these linear functions. How can I do that? So, first, you need to integrate this function to, to, cancel, to, uh, to cancel the effect of the derivative. And then you take the exponential, then you can get uh, the product of these linear functions. And then we get the notion of zeta functions. So I define the zeta function of the hypersurface S over the finite field FQ is rival U to be the exponential, then I need to integrate uh, this form of power series. So this is, here you see why I lower the, uh, the degree by one, because the, here I need to integrate that function. Then if you integrate it, you get S to one to infinity, then n S prime over S. S. This is called the zeta function. of the projector hypersurface S, S over the finite field. Okay. And uh, just by this equality, we see that actually this zeta function is a rational function, and then it has the form P to the U. We have a polynomial here, uh, but actually we don't know whether it is in the numerator or denominator, because we have an exponent here. And then the denominator, which corresponds to the first R terms, is very easy. It's 1 over u, or 1 minus u, 1 minus q u, 1 minus q to the R minus 1. Here we have a very, uh, very nice uh, expression for the zeta function. Here is p, numerator the product of all the linear functions. So, okay. What's yeah. the exponent on the last uh, Q um, factor? Uh, R minus one. Q to the R minus one. So this thing, this thing, this function is the the main 
the main object we want to study in this lecture, namely the zeta function of a projective ride. In this special case, we see that it is a rational function. Uh, actually, we can say uh, a little bit more about this rational function. Uh, for example, actually, you can show that uh, this polynomial actually has coefficients uh, in, in Q. Actually, it's a, uh, all the, if you just expand it, all, although this C alpha is, is just an algebraic num uh, number, it cannot be uh, an integer. But if you just expand it, you, you can show that it actually is a, a polynomial with integers, uh, with coefficients in, in, uh, in integers. And also, <coughs> I can say something about the actual value of this C alpha, because this C alpha, after a sign, is just a Jacobi sum. So, the actual value, given by Q to the R minus 1 over 2, so power of square root Q. Uh, and moreover, you just consider the map here, A maps to Q to the R minus 1 over A. This is the map from the set of complex numbers to the set of complex numbers. Uh, the important thing is this map will permute all these C alphas. In other words, it it permutes all the, the inverse of the zeros of, the, of these polynomials. And then it indicates that this is a function satisfies some functional equation, but I do not want to uh, write down the, the functional equation here. But I mean, just from this observation, we see that the zeta function of a hypersurface uh, it first is rational and it has some, a lot of interesting properties. And uh, based on this computation, Andrew Wei raised his famous conjecture uh, for the zeta function of uh, arbitrary smooth projective variety uh, over finite. And he, he can prove his conjecture uh, when the variety has dimension one, namely uh, the zeta function of a projective curve. Uh, and uh, in the rest of this lecture, I want to uh, first give you the statements of Wei's conjecture, and uh, then I try to give, a, give you a proof uh, of Wei's proof uh, of this conjecture for uh, projective curve. So, First, I give you the statements of the, of the conjecture. Uh, here, I only give you the, the same other conjecture for uh, projective curves, because that's the thing I want to prove in this lecture. And you have time, I will mention uh, what, the, what the general statement of the conjecture uh, look like at the end of, the, uh, of this series of talks. So, I start from a, a smooth projective curve. And uh, that's what we do for hyperservices. I define the zeta function. I apologize here for the, uh, for the inconsistent notations. Here I change the variable to be t. Uh, it's just a exponential of the formal power series. Here the coefficients in the numerator is just the number of fq to the m, uh, the number of fq to the m rational points on, the, on this curve. And Q, uh, fq to the m is just a 
finite uh, extension of F cubed uh, with degree M. Okay? Just consider all the possible finite extensions of F cubed, then you consider the, uh, the rational points inside that field, consider the number, and that's the coefficients of the formal power series. Then for this theta function, first, by just from the definition, we only know that it is a formal power series. But uh, the way you conjecture says it is a very nice function with a lot of good property. The first part of the conjecture is called a uh, uh, rationality. Uh, it tells you that this is a function. It is actually a rational function. Just that's what we uh, see in the case of hypersurfaces. Uh, actually, we can uh, see a little bit more. There exists a non-negative integer g, uh, which is called the genus of the curve c. And uh, a polynomial. This uh, polynomial uh, with integer coefficients uh, and uh, the degree to G finds of the genus such that the zeta function. It's a rational function, or in other words, it's the quotient of two polynomials. The numerator is this polynomial of the number 2g. Denominator is very similar with the denominator uh, of the theta function of hypersurfaces. This is 1 minus t, 1 minus g. Okay? This is the first part, the rationality. It says the zeta function is a rational function. The second part of the conjecture predicts that this is a function satisfying uh, a functional equation. Equation is, is an equation which relates 